Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we're discussing workers' compensation post-COVID and specifically occupational injuries, telemedicine, IME, you are living in. Our uh, topic today is how to maximize uh, your IMEs and how to deal with things like telemedicine. So we, my name is, by the way, Rich Lenkov. I'm with Bryce Downey and Lenkov. We are a Chicago and Indiana, or Illinois and Indiana firm. We handle workers' compensation as well as many other practice areas like liability, products, uh, liability, uh, employment law, labor, intellectual property, lots of different things. I head up the firm's workers' comp department, and I also handle liability. And most importantly, we're very privileged to have um, Dr. Brian Cole with us. Uh, Dr. Cole is one of the uh, foremost orthopedic surgeons, not just in uh, Illinois, but in the country. I've had the privilege of working with him uh, over the course of many years professionally and will attest to the uh, excellent manner in which he handles um, patient care. He also does a great job with uh, IMEs, although that's a very small percentage of his practice. He's a very, very sought after and, and busy practitioner of orthopedic surgery. Um, he's also a head team physician, as you see in front of you, for the Chicago Bulls, White Sox, and the Chicago Dogs. Uh, that will be very relevant to our trivia, which you have to stay until the end for. We've got some fun trivia and some giveaways at the end of the presentation. Dr. Cole is also Associate Chairman and Professor at the Department of Orthopedics for Rush University Medical Center. He is the Chairman of the Department of Surgery for Rush uh, Orthopedics. He specializes in shoulder, elbows, and knees, and he is the Section Head for Cartilage Restoration Cent for the Cartilage Restoration Center at Rush. So, Dr. Cole, thank you so much for joining us. We know you're busy and appreciate your time this morning. Rich, thank you, and uh, thank you to you and your staff for putting this on, and I look forward to the next hour. All right, so moving forward, we're going to start with uh, some legal perspectives, but this is, you know, meant to be very interactive, so you got a disclaimer, of course, and some other things. We are recording today's webinar, as we do always. We have uh, probably a six-year bank of monthly webinars, sometimes more frequently than every month. Uh, in the wake of all the changes that we've seen with Illinois uh, workers' compensation, or attempted changes, I should say, as well as the issues raised by the pandemic, we've been speaking very frequently over the last few uh, weeks. So if you haven't had a chance to attend one of our webinars, uh, we've been fortunate enough to present with some of the leaders in the industry, people like Dr. Cole. So shoot me an email at rlenkov at bdlfirm.com, and we'll send you a prior webinar. Again, if you can think of the topic, we've covered it. We also do a monthly newsletter um, that covers breaking news. Again, my marketing uh, team has been working overdrive putting these out because there's so much news coming out of uh, Illinois over the last few weeks. All right, so we um, want this to be very interactive as always, and we, we're starting with a poll with a hypothetical, which we'll get to in a moment. But you've got a Q&A box in front of you. Please jump in with uh, questions at any point. I think we'll answer them as they come up rather than wait till the end. And uh, we're going to start with legal, uh, some legal thoughts, but Dr. Cole's going to jump in. I'm going to throw some questions at him as we go through the initial poll. So when I'm done with the poll, you're going to have a chance to vote uh, which of the answers you think is accurate. Then we'll tell you what we think the accurate answer is. Um, you don't have to type your answer for this one in the Q&A box. You merely have to give your multiple choice answer in the poll. So. With that exhausting intro out of the way, we're going to jump into our poll. So Deborah injures her knee while working as a nurse for Second City Ortho. Her treating physician recommends surgery. Accident is accepted, so accident's not an issue. You, as the claim handler, dispute causation and the surgery that's been recommended by her treater. So you, again, are the claims handler. You represent her employer, which is Second City Ortho. Deborah skips to the IME that you scheduled to dispute causation and surgery because Illinois is under a stay-at-home order. So you are the claims handler. By the way, uh, under this hypothetical, doctor visits are an exception to the stay-at-home order. You are the claims handler for Second City, which again is Deborah, the injured nurse's employer. 
you should, here are your options, and we're gonna open this up to a poll in a moment. You should either A, pay benefits until the stay-at-home order is lifted, B, pay benefits because the treater has recommended surgery, C, terminate benefits because Deborah skipped the IME, or D, terminate benefits because you're disputing causation and necessity of surgery. So we're now gonna open up the poll, give you a few seconds to think about and give us your answer, then we're gonna show you the poll results in a moment. 63% of you thought that C was the correct answer, that you would terminate benefits because she skipped the IME. We have results for the rest of the options. Uh, the answer is, in fact, C, so that 63% of you are correct. Does anyone in the Q&A box want to put why you chose an uh, A, B, or D, why you would still pay benefits? It's okay if we disagree. That'll make it interesting. But anyone want to see why you picked either pay benefits, even though she skipped the IME, or terminate benefits for the other reason? Rich, while they're doing that, is um, is the stay-at-home order, you said doctor's visits are exempt, right, from the stay-at-home right. order. Is an IME a doctor's visit? That's a great question. Well, let's, let's address that. All right, so let's move forward. The reason the answer is C is because um, Section 12 that governs IMEs is not out the window because we're in a pandemic. Um, as Dr. Cole will tell you, he is seeing uh, people for IMEs. Uh, IMEs are still happening, and they're happening more as things open up more. So in the initial, here's the challenge. In the initial phases of this, March 18th or March 17th, the federal government says essential, non-essential. Then they say elective surgery, but they didn't really speak to practice of medicine per se but they said elective surgery is considered non-essential, so no more elective surgery. The next day, we shut down our practice to emergent, and which meant life limb and life-threatening, or right. things that, if not treated, might or could lead to, because of the time sensitivity of the clinical problem, to a worse outcome. We stopped doing IMEs at that time because we didn't know which way, we didn't know which way was up, quite frankly. Right. So we, we went to that mode because Arguably, it was all centered on hospital resources, and in certain places, these are geographic-specific considerations, hospital resources were, in, 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 were compromised. So it was hard to argue, I would find it hard to argue that an IME is a essential uh, event, if you will, uh, when you're dealing with PPE, ICU beds, and ventilators in some settings. Now, arguably, if you're in Rockford, where they're not seeing it, and I'm at Rush, where they have a demand, they may have a different lens. So that was the big challenge with all of these executive order type statements is that it was really regional dependent and it depended upon what lens you were looking through. So I, I would see this as a very controversial issue depending on the timing of and the geography where that question was asked, if you will. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and now that things have evolved a little bit since those early days, um, I think, you know, our viewpoint is a little different, but I will unabashedly tell you that I would deny benefits in this scenario. I think that we would stand a strong chance of prevailing on the issue of whether the skipped IME is legitimate or not. Uh, Linda wrote in, uh, she chose A because if she catches, she meaning the claimant, catches COVID going to the IME, it's going to be part of her claim. Uh, Linda, you are our all-star uh, webinar attendee. But I disagree with you because um, just because she goes to an IME doesn't mean that if she catches COVID, that it results from that, right? The very right. nature of COVID is that you can catch it in so many places. And I would argue that we have the ability, and Dr. Cole will talk to you about this, we have the ability to show how much care is taken during an IME during this time, that the chances of catching it at the doctor's office are minimal. But, you know, obviously we put in a lot of, you know, uh, uh, good options for a reason. So let's jump into, um, you know, the legal perspective, then we'll turn it over to the doctor because this is very relevant. Um, again, we still have the ability to send petitioners to IMEs. That's one of the 
foremost tools we have in Illinois, and uh, that hasn't been taken away. Petitioners still have to go, and if they don't go, you can terminate benefits just like you did before. If the claimant has a subjective fear uh, of going to the doctor or leaving their house or is under the mistaken belief that IMEs don't count, I think it's a mistaken belief that IMEs don't count because, you know, it's a doctor visit. So I think it definitely qualifies under an exception to, you know, any stay-at-home order because it's a doctor visit. But if a petitioner has a subjective belief that they shouldn't leave the house, that's on them. I, I sympathize, you know, with people who have that fear, but the reality is that things are opening up. And I'm not, I'm not one of the people who are believing in opening up everything in a hurry. I'm of the opposite camp. I think we're opening up too quickly. That being said, um, going to a doctor or going to an IME um, is something that you have to do until someone tells us differently, until a court says otherwise, until the legislation has changed. Uh, so right now, I would continue, and we are continuing to schedule IMEs. Uh, there are great doctors like Dr. Cole continuing to see patients. And I'll tell you, the, 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 the bottom line is, uh, and the ultimate answer is, whether our opponents are telling their clients not to go to IMEs. They're not. You know, I probably had a dozen IMEs, at least in the last few weeks, uh, and not one opposing counsel has told me they're not sending their clients because of the reasons that we put forth in our PowerPoint. I had one uh, say they couldn't go to the IME because they had COVID. That's a good reason, okay? And we, we worked around that and we rescheduled it. I would certainly not advocate sending a COVID claimant to a doctor or anywhere, right? Don't confuse what we're saying. If you have COVID, don't leave the house. Certainly don't go to see Dr. Cole in his office. He won't see you. Uh, you know, so so don't don't schedule an IME if you've got a COVID patient. That person should be at home quarantined. But if you get someone with a knee injury, um, you know, there's no reason why they can't go to the uh, IME. Uh, we've got a question: What if the claimant can't get childcare to be able to attend the IME alone? Again, that's not that's on them. I mean, again, I'm sympathetic, but I have a duty to you know follow the law, and and there's no provision for childcare in Section 12. Um, you know, we have to give them mileage reimbursement. Uh, if you send them somewhere far, you know, that requires overnight travel, you pay for that. But there's no new provision for added benefits because of, of COVID. Rich, so I would, you know, it's interesting. I would just add, so here we are, May 15th. I don't, I'm not sure I would have had the same discussion on March 15th, per se. Right. Uh, but I agree with everything you're saying today. Um, we clearly had a period and everyone had a period where, you know, I wouldn't, I had an IME scheduled and I canceled because we were, we would have said that it's not essential uh, at that particular moment. But everything you're saying now holds true, I believe. Uh, a, doctor's visits considered essential. B, this is a doctor's visit. Uh, C, it's available to them. Uh, it's not not available. Uh, so I would argue that all the rules apply as normal and today is normal. There may have been a temporary window where the petitioner or opposing side would have had a good argument. Probably the best argument is the IME wasn't available, right? You would not hold them, you know, if it's not available, yeah, it's hard to hold them responsible for not attending. I would have also offered at that time that, and it was interesting how few people took up on this. I did probably 12 record reviews during that time. There were the IMEs that turned into record reviews. And I, I really felt that I could do as good a job with a record review as I could with seeing the, play, the claimant. And, right. if you add it, and if you add it to that, put them on telemedicine so I can ask some questions that help solidify causality and symptoms. The physical exam is a very small part of it. So I, it's amazing to me how few people took advantage of that at a time where benefits were being extended or cut off or created lots of legal problems. Uh, it, it's a shame because we've all learned, like we're doing today, we're having a decent interaction here uh, and not having to, to leave our homes or our offices. So I would argue that the future probably holds a bit of this and you should think outside the box because there's lots and lots of efficiencies that you and I could have. And I think I could have, we could have solved a lot of problems by telemedicine or, you know, virtual interactions that people just weren't willing to do. Absolutely. And we'll get to that in a, more, a little more detail when we talk to telemedicine, but I, I agree. Absolutely. We've got a question. What if, um, what if, uh, I guess this means what a petitioner or the claimant is saying they have COVID in order to skip the IME? Um, we were saying doctor's note. 
Yeah, we were doctor. saying Indiana. We were saying provide a doctor's note because we have a prepay policy. More than happy to refund if there's a medical issue. Uh, if because we're stuck with the same thing, we're blocking a spot, and they right. say, "Well, I don't want to come because I'm scared of getting COVID." You know, that's kind of on them, not us, unfortunately. Right. But we're we're in the business of making people feel comfortable doing what they're doing and creating a safe environment. And I can tell you, I'm not going to work. We'll talk about this later unless I feel safe. I've got the same liability as all of you on this on this webinar have. So it's our job to convey that. But if they make a decision not to come because of that, I don't think that's rational. Agree. Um, I had that situation, like I mentioned, with a IME last week where the attorney told me the day before the exam that the, the claimant had COVID and, and couldn't go to the exam. It would have been nice to hear you know, that a few days before to avoid a cancellation fee, but we had a doctor's note and um, the doctor was nice enough to waive yeah, the cancellation I, yeah. fee. We're doing the same thing. I wouldn't, I, there's so much sensitivities here. There's, the, we all have to make some accommodations. Yeah, but, but Pat, it's a great question. And again, as the doctor said, require a doctor's note. Um, you know, you may require proof of the positive test, but generally a doctor's note, I think, is pretty trustworthy. All right, so, uh, but great questions. Keep them coming. We love questions. All right, so we, we, we addressed the petitioner will not attend because they're scared. That's on them. Deny benefits. Lack of IME doctors we addressed, you know, there are plenty of doctors. I'm getting, you know, ads, I think, every day from doctors who want IME business. Um, not from Dr. Cole because he's very busy, but, um, you know, there are doctors who are seeing patients uh, right now, so it's business, mostly business as usual. Uh, sorry, we got a question. What about if they are unable to get a doctor's note due to the fact they are instructed to self-quarantine and those doctors are booked? I mean, you know... Um, I don't want to get too much in the weeds on, on every detail, but they need a doctor's note. I would not accept their word on it. You know, as the doctor pointed out, you can have telemedicine. I, I can't imagine that a claimant or their attorney couldn't just call a doctor and say, you know, I need a doctor's note. Um, those are readily available. So I would, you know, demand that. I certainly would not advocate canceling it or paying benefits without some proof on their end that they actually can attend. But great question. Keep keep those questions coming. Lack of medical record. So that's, you know, that's sort of an issue that we're seeing um, because as Dr. Cole will attest, he needs a full history, a full picture of what's going on with the claimant in order to render an opinion, in order to do his job and, and you know, tell you what he thinks. So a big part of that story is prior medical, uh, not just prior, but current medical. It's definitely a little more challenging to get medical now. Just everything's slower, right? Everything's a little more delayed. You know, make sure that doesn't stop you from, from doing your job and getting the records. You know, we've got some great partners who obtain rec records for us. It's a little slower, but you still need to get them. You still need to get them to Dr. Cole so he could do his job. You know, it might be where Dr. Cole still sees the claimant but holds off on uh, a report until he gets the records that's fine too it's yeah that's enough yeah we we had this call this one you know i had a call last night uh from my one of our coordinators and one of the case managers was furious that we wouldn't let her come to the visit which she was told she couldn't come to the visit but was given the option to have us call her during the visit facetime or or as my coordinator said facebook so you can see what i'm dealing with uh and uh then or call afterwards and my policy that I've set up for the group is please be flexible and sensitive. Uh, everyone's trying to do their jobs. People are trying to remain employed, including case managers, independent of how people feel one way or another about all of our different roles. And we can still do social distancing and allow the case manager to come to the visit. They, it's amazing how you know, they're just so worried about not doing their job when they can do their job equally well, I believe, I believe by a FaceTime call so that they can document their time, document the fact that they've done what they needed to do for the client and whatever role they're supposed to be filling and typically to fill, they can still do it in an alternative way. It's, uh, I find it a little bit frustrating that people can't, are not willing to think outside the box here. It's like coming to work when you're sick. You know, it's just something you don't do. That being said, uh, records, and I said, look, we need to be flexible not to frustrate people because everyone what this is a bit of an onion and every time you speak with someone of what challenges they're having you hear a different side of it that you or me may not even appreciate so the home care issue the child care i spoke with the case manager yesterday she has eight kids at home and she's doing her job as a case manager and um 
they're not kids like little kids or whole family is home. The whole house is full of the whole family. They're sort of, that's their quarantine is their whole family and the in-laws and so forth. So the point is that we have to be remain a little bit sensitive. So like Rich said, I just will say I'm not going to release the report until you give me the medical records. I got to do my job. So I'm not going to make you cancel the visit. I understand there's a lot that goes into this. You know, my, the problem is just keep on keep in mind that sometimes the messaging internally, we have all these new processes in place, uh, even how to call the case manager that they wanted to be called. They put it somewhere in the medical record where I couldn't even find it. And I'm like, look, we've got to test our processes so we don't frustrate the system any more than it already is frustrated based on the environment we're in. So I would argue that each of you, if you're looking for sort of a level of service and feel like you're not getting it, but it makes sense, don't be afraid to reach out because we get a lot of blind spots in delivering care right now because there's 15 to 20 different things we're doing today that we weren't doing three weeks ago. And we're just trying to make it right. And not, if it fails, it's not by intent, it's just by blind spots. So just some points, we can still get it done, but we've got to remain nimble and sensitive. Yeah, and, and the fact that we're even, you know, having IMEs and this stuff is continuing so soon after the start is, is fairly amazing when you think about it. I mean, we, we really haven't seen that much of a blip despite, you know, world-changing events. And I think it just speaks to the ability of all of us to, you know, really change on a dime. So it's really impressive that yeah, I agree. We're even, we're even having this discussion today in, in the midst of, what, two days ago, Illinois had the worst you know, most deadly day yet. So um, Dr. Cole's point is a good one. And, you know, listen, we need to be flexible. You need to be um, uh, a little more sensitive than you ever were. That being said, I'm not one of these attorneys who's going to tell you, you know, quit being aggressive or quit doing your job as, you know, us on the defense side, because I'll tell you, the other side is not quitting. You know, they're continuing to file claims and continuing to ask for outrageous amounts of money. So we need to be vigilant. We need to, yes, be sensitive, um, but still do our jobs. And until the legislature tells us something different or the, the courts are, we're proceeding um, as business as usual. Um, but to that point, the one that I just mentioned, uh, one of the challenges we are having as it relates to IMEs and treatment in general is the fact that the commission, the Illinois Workers' Compensation Commission, is basically shut down. Just a few minutes ago, I got uh, an email from one of my attorneys that attended a phone call, the status call today, and the arbitrator basically said everything's going to be continued and he's not dismissing anything. You know, we are pretty aggressive in filing motions to dismiss when we feel that the other side is not moving. The arbitrator said, I'm not doing it. I'm not dismissing any case uh, for a while. Um, so that's a challenge because, you know, a remedy that we have in enforcing IMEs and enforcing proper compliance with medical treatment uh, is to go to court, right? I mean, um, ultimately, if we're not agreeing and if the other side is not doing what we think they should do, there's a mechanism. That mechanism is uh, the commission. The commission is shut down basically but for, you know, a very small amount of emergencies. So whereas, you know, a few months ago, uh, if a claimant didn't go to an IME, uh, we could go to a trial and force that issue. Or if a petitioner was not complying with medical treatment, we could have a trial and force that issue. The fact that we don't have that enforcement mechanism right now makes things much more difficult. It slows down the process considerably. Uh, my couple of other points, and then I'll turn you over to the doctor, is one of the attendees uh, or registrants uh, asked about, does the treater versus IME challenge um, change now? In other words, you know, traditionally people think, especially in Illinois, that if you've got an IME uh, versus a treater, you're going to lose that battle. So the answer is no, nothing's changed. And no, that's not an accurate, uh, that's not an accurate statement. We think that that's a cliche that's gone by the wayside. Um, you know, the idea that if you've got Dr. Cole on, on your side versus a uh, treater, you're going to lose just because Dr. Cole is perceived as a retained expert is not true. And we could send you, you know, you know, recent decisions where the commission has agreed with us. The reality is if you've got a credible doctor who, you know, credibly says things like no causation or no need for surgery, you can win that case in Illinois every day, and we do win those cases. 
What's important is whether the doctor is credentialed, whether they know what they're talking about, whether they're board certified, whether they specialize in the body part that you're talking about, right? It's best to get an elbow doctor for an elbow injury, not a foot doctor for an elbow injury. Um, but as long as you've got a qualified doctor, and I would assert that, you know, we only retain the most qualified doctors like Dr. Cole. And by the way, I'll just say this out loud. Dr. Cole and I have worked together on, on, on some cases, not a ton. Um, and he doesn't always say what I want him to say. He's not one of these doctors that, oh, it's Dr. Cole. You know what he's going to say going in and you're paying X amount yeah. for that. Dr. Cole has a reputation that, you know, is second to none. And not to speak for him, but knowing him and having heard him on the stand, he will tell you that that's far more important than, you know, a couple of bucks from an IME. And he's never going to say something just because he's being paid by one side or the other. And that's what good doctors do. You know, the best doctors are the ones who will sometimes tell you, you're wrong. This case uh, is a loser for you. Uh, petitioner uh, does have a legitimate injury or it's related to work. Um, you want credible doctors. You don't want ones that are guaranteed opinions because that will come out eventually. It'll eventually, you know, a smart plaintiff's lawyer will ask Dr. Cole in a deposition or whoever you hire, oh, how many times do you find on behalf of, uh, petitioner, uh, you know, who didn't hire you in this case. And if the doctor says, well, never, then their credibility is lost. So hire doctors that are credible, who don't just do, you know, legal work for a living. You know, the best ones are ones who do. But the reality is you won't lose that battle if you do what we're talking about. And as proof, um, a little over a year ago, we had a commissioner, none other than Commissioner Capoletti from the uh, commission. There's only a few of these people on this planet. And she was nice enough to give us her time. And in this webinar, she said the following words. I look at the evidence that's presented to me. I don't discount a doctor just because petitioner's attorney is saying they're terribly respondent friendly, nor do I put greater weight in a treating physician just because they're the treating physician. I look at the, what their opinion is and why they're providing it. That's it. So any, if you leave here with only one takeaway, and I know you're going to leave with many after you hear from Dr. Cole, but it should be that an, you can win a case with a good IME doctor. Um, don't think you're going to lose just because the tie goes to the runner, so to speak. I just so, can I make a can I make a couple yeah. comments that you made me think about? You know, um, look, we you, what you lose as a physician who does IMEs is that feedback loop. There's a satisfaction feedback loop that, frankly, has become even more magnified recently. You know, I went a few weeks without doing surgery and seeing patients, and you know, we are when you talk to physicians, most will still say they'll go back to the time they decided they want to go into medicine, that they doing it, they're doing it because they really want to help people. And the feedback loop we get is every day you show up in the office and someone has an outcome that uh, that sort of still goes to your soul. And it's it's not even though what the public or out others may think, although that's changed given the current environment in a positive way, uh, physicians now are considered heroes rather than you know other uh, other uh, subjective uh, observations that you might or might or could hear. Um, I would say that um, while you lose the satisfaction of the feedback that we get in terms of getting good outcome, the the satisfaction of doing an IME is the intellectual side of it to me, and 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 the and the the fact pattern. So this commissioner, I, it's nice to hear this because I'm often baffled when this line of questioning in a deposition goes the direction that Rich has said, which is, you know, well, how many do you do this way and the other way? And you know, my answer is I typically uh, maybe 70% uh, come from uh, the respondent side and maybe 30% come from the petitioner side, but I rule in favor of causality probably 90% of the time, and the respondents are still selling me those, sending those patients, and or the defense is still sending those patients. I get confused the same, I guess. So the point is that um, it, I would, I've always felt in this setting, obviously you guys want something that is a, an opinion that's in your best interest, but this is the one space in the legal realm that I've, that I get continued positive feedback from everyone, both the, the defense, the, the plaintiff or petitioner respondent, and the, the, the commissioners that say, look, you're just known to be really fair and we're good with your opinion because that's the right answer. And, you know, the, the legal game is interesting when it comes to tort um, and liability. It isn't always like that. Uh, I felt that this has been, a, this and with good attorneys on both sides and good people on both sides, even the adjusters who don't want to pay the bills, when they hear the answer, like, yeah, I get it. This makes sense. This So the physician side, so I'm, what I'm, I'll just conclude by saying is that 
a good opinion is one where the physician says the basis of my opinion is this and it shouldn't and that should make sense like every explanation should make sense if it doesn't make sense then that's what you should question don't question the process of who that person is do exactly what Rich said is they should be credible and knowledgeable in this space so they know the natural history, the pre-existing aspects, what would happen but for the injury, all these other things they need to know. That's why it's good to have a specialist. But I think the onus is on us to at least give the basis of our opinion. Um, and I read these four hires, IMEs, all the time. And they're, it's ridiculous what I see written by my colleagues sometimes. I'm, I don't understand how they look themselves in the mirror. And they just don't care about what others think, I guess, because it, it would never hold up in a deposition. Never. Either side's got to be, you know, really questioning even the person who hired that person. They're like, this is my only chance. I'm just going to get a hired, a hired guy. So I, 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 that part I find sometimes particularly uh, challenging, uh, to be honest. But what you said, what you said, Articulate, is exactly who I am. And I can tell you my partners, too. Our guys are pretty, I don't know, if, you know, we may have bends, stereotypes in the outside in. But when they're in a deposition, I hope that all my partners behave the same way I do in terms of substantiating, giving the basis of their opinion that they wouldn't want to embarrass themselves. Yep, and to that point, you know, a stereotype is, well, you know, doctor, you know, you're making a lot of money off this exam and, you know, X number of dollars and your practice is making X number of dollars. Here's the real world example of how that works. Um, Dr. Cole, I retained Dr. Cole for a liability, a, a tort case I had a couple of years ago in Lake County, Illinois. Uh, it was a slip and fall at a retail store, and we went, to the, you know, we went to a jury trial on it, and I retained Dr. Cole. And the other attorney, the plaintiff's lawyer, made a huge deal and spent a long time on the idea of how much money Dr. Cole was charging for this. And, you know, that's something you have to disclose. Uh, we made no secret of it, and we disclosed it. Dr. Cole explained, by the way, like, Dr. Cole did a great job explaining how money has nothing to do with it. But talking about money... Dr. Cole explained how, you know, he's a busy, much sought after orthopedic surgeon in Chicago, and he explained to the jury how much, you know, money he could make in the time he's spending on, on, on this case, how much time he could, how much money he could make treating patients. So it's actually far more lucrative for him to treat patients than do litigation. Despite that, he does it because he sees some value to it. But in case your case devolves to the bottom line is of dollars versus you know, dollars, the answer is Dr. Cole and people like him actually make more money not doing IMEs than doing IMEs. Rich, can um, you tell them the outcome of that case? The outcome is what was most stunning. It was the best. Well, it was everybody great, won. Everybody <laughs> won on that case. It was a great outcome. We, uh, it was a highly disputed case, um, uh, and, uh, you know, plaintiff had a real injury. I think it was... Um, the slip and a fall, and it bruised his hip, but yeah, they, they, they said the meniscus... The meniscus tear, which developed months later, based upon an NBA article I wrote that shows that NBA players, 43% of them have meniscal tears and don't know it. So they kept saying that the guy di didn't know he had a meniscal tear at the time, had no pain, and he had pain later, therefore it was caused by the fall. It was the most illogical argument I've, I've heard. And, and, I, and I remember saying to the guy, well, you, you, can he fake, doctor, can't you fake having an injury? And I said, yes, you can fake having an injury and limp and so forth, but you can't fake not having an injury, you know? It was so bizarre. In fact, I remember the plaintiff attorney. I, I, is, is there any chance the plaintiff attorney is on this call? <laughs> Unless he changed his name to one of our clients, probably not, but no, he's but not. He, he's I remember he just started sweating, and I, <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I almost felt bad. But the jury, tell him what the finding was. It was interesting. Yeah, the jury, and by the way, you know, even though the doctor did a, did a great job explaining why the history was incredible. This guy had a credible orthopedic surgeon. I mean, a seemingly credible orthopedic surgeon that Dr. Cole yeah. knows, we won't mention, yeah. who, who related it all. So it shows you how, you know, you could have two uh, conflicting opinions. But yeah, the jury actually found in favor of the plaintiff on liability, which, you know, we were fighting liability. Uh, but liability was probably a loser in retrospect, and the jury certainly agreed. But they, so they, they found four plaintiff on liability, and then when it comes to damages, he was asking for, I think, like 120000 or something, and he had... I think it was higher. I think it was higher. higher. Um, and he, uh, I think he had, like, 60 a shoulder. Something. Yeah, he had a shoulder. They were going for a shoulder, rotator cuff, ultimately replacement, a knee, meniscus, ultimately replacement, and then a hip bruise. Yeah, so, I mean, the medical specials were substantial, and not to get into a rabbit hole, the specials are how, you know, it's a big part of how he calculate damages. Anyway, after hearing Dr. Cole testify... The jury came back and awarded him um, 
thousand dollars. It was yeah, I think it was less than a thousand. It was the value of the first hip treatment minus fifty percent for his own negligence. So it was like a few hundred bucks. And they honed in on, on Dr. Cole's opinion that if anything was related, it was this initial hip visit. Everything after that was not credibly related because it took so long. And we talked to the jurors after, which you often do in a, in a jury trial, and they were nice enough to tell us what they thought. And, you know, almost all of them put a ton of stock into what Dr. Cole said, you know, which is nice to hear. Not so nice to hear that they didn't, you know, put en enough stock in my legal skills, but I was happy that uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Cole paid off and they really, they really agreed with what he said. So that's a real world example of how, you know, a good expert could really turn a case in. You know, the demand in that case was was tons. So it was a ton. So we digressed a little bit, but that's good. Uh, that's very interesting, interesting stuff. We'll turn you over to Dr. Cole, tell you a little bit more, uh, expand a little bit more uh, based on what he said in terms of where we're where we are, where we're going with IMEs and also telemedicine. Yeah, I'll just to finish the a point about that case, it speaks to the value of the treater. You know, I get asked, I, I will see a patient in work comp and then they will do a deposition and and I will say they send him to me for evaluation and treatment. When I'm seeing a patient evaluation treatment, I'm not answering questions about causality. If they want an IME, order an IME. They're sending me for treatment. I'm going to assume it's already an accepted claim. I'll be, I will ap absolutely answer about how much time it's going to take to get better, when he can get back to work, give them light duty right after the treatment, all of that stuff, and give them the MMI projections, disability, whatever they need or impairment. But I'm not going to comment on causality. In fact, I'm barely getting into it. That's important because once they depose me and they say, what about causality? I'm going to say, well, I got to look at this with an entirely different lens. Give me the ER records. Give me what, when they complained of pain. You know, I never really went into that level of detail. I'm poorly equipped to determine causality if I'm being a treater. Most treaters don't, when I'm an expert, like that case that Rich sent me, you know, it's probably no fault of the treater. He didn't have those records, I bet. He never spent the time. He wasn't incented. He wasn't asked. He just said, what do you think? Yeah, the patient told me after he slipped and fell, he had hip, hip pain, shoulder pain, and knee pain. And I just took him for his word. He never looked at the ER records. I looked at everything and found out that nothing showed up for months later. So how could it be related? It was just a simple case. Shouldn't have even gone that far. It was, in, a, in my opinion, it was an abuse of the system. But the point is that he was, he was blinded to the facts because he never sought the facts. My job is to be an arbitrator in a way to say, give me the facts. And I've ruled against patients I've treated. I said, look, this isn't even causally related. I never, now that you're asking me this opinion, now I'm serving as an, an expert in that way. And in a way, I'm kind of screwing myself. I get my, I do much better than I, I'm, we're comp reimbursement of the fee schedule I do with Blue Cross Blue Shield, but that's the right answer if you look at the facts. So treaters are not always equipped to give good opinions, in my, in my, in my opinion, on causality. Just a, a blind a great, spot there. It's a great point. And just one thing I'll interject really quickly is, um, you know, they're, they're biased. I mean, just to, just to cut to the chase, I believe, and my argument generally is that the treater is not objective. The reason it's called an I, the I in IME is independent, right? And you need to assert to your trier of fact, whatever state you're in, that your retained expert is the only one, the only doctor ever in the history of the case that truly is independent. And the treater is different. The treater is, you know, far more biased than your IME doctor. Yeah, I would, I, but if a treater gives you an opinion, ask them what the basis of the opinion is. Right. Well, the patient told me this. Is that good enough? I mean, is that all you got to do in this world is tell what someone it, told me? You know what? It's amazing how many times uh, on a carpal tunnel case, for example, that's highly disputed, right? I and mean, we, we don't pay on carpal tunnel cases because the, the medical generally isn't there, but it's amazing how often a doctor, a treater will say, oh, I find causation because petitioner said so, not based on knowledge of the job, not based on a job description, right. because petitioner, oh, well, they said so. Oh, well, okay, well, then we'll pay the case. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't base a medical opinion, an expert opinion on petitioner's history. That's nonsense. All right, so I'll go through um, just briefly. You know, in mid-March, when the federal mandate uh, of essential versus non-essential led to the elimination of elective surgery, then locally uh, in Illinois, we have executive orders that really reiterate the same. When no one really contemplated what, exact, what exactly elective surgery is, to be quite frank. But the real, the, at the start of this, we all had so many, you know, unknowns. And, and in a way, many of us, I'm sure, felt like the world was going to come to an end, quite frankly. We just didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. And um, uh, we were really only had our eyes on not, uh, avoiding overwhelming the hospital system. We had seen what happened in New York and Seattle, and clearly there were patients in the hallway who were dying who couldn't get the immediate care they needed, who could have, whose lives could have been saved. I know that because when I look at Russia, which is one of the top 35 COVID hospitals, who knows how to evaluate a patient, knows when they have to transition from the ER 
to be admitted to the general medicine floor, to go to the ICU, to then be intubated, to then be put in a prone position, to then be put on one of three medications that modify the disease, we've learned a whole lot. And if you can't get access to that because, A, there aren't enough healthcare workers because they're all sick, there aren't enough things because there wasn't enough PPE, there aren't enough ventilators, there aren't enough beds in the ICU, we have a really big problem on our hands. And frankly, that's what happened to my colleagues who were orthopedic surgeons who were managing ventilators in New York at Brooklyn Hospital of Special Surgery at Cornell. Similarly in Seattle when they initially were overloaded. They just didn't have the things in place. So forget about IMEs and all these other things. We were dealing with a, a crisis mode of life and death in some places. And you can say, well, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I live in Kenosha. We haven't had a case in Kenosha. You know, what are you doing? Why am I not able to go to Starbucks and get an egg sandwich? You know, the reality is there are geographic differences here. And um, I found it, you know, a little bit surprising that I could go to Giordano's and get a pizza at the door, but I couldn't do someone who had chronic pain, couldn't sleep, couldn't walk, or couldn't raise their arm, and couldn't go to work, whose job was available to them because of the orthopedic problem. And that was considered non-essential. So you can tell that I've had a lot of sort of pent-up philosophical and passion about this topic. Eventually, over the last month and a half, things have evolved, and we've pushed them to evolve. I've written four articles that are, that are used nationally to help hospital systems and orthopedic practices specifically actually emerge at the same time we're living with COVID. So the, the, the real option now is we are just going to live with COVID, okay, folks? I mean, that's the reality. And a lot will be different. And I can't tell you when it's going to change, but I'm faced with the obligation of not only managing a group, which is uh, has a, around 500 employees, 50 physicians, 50 to 70 advanced practitioners, occupational medicine and non-occupational medicine, keeping us in business so that patients have a place to go to manage payroll and, and you know, our physicians for a month and a half, no one took a salary uh, that wasn't, wasn't there. And uh, we asked our employed physicians and our partners of an LLC to not take a payment. Uh, and, we, and they did that. And we did that because we're concerned about cash flow. Once we come back online, it takes two months to get a claim paid uh, in general. So once we start delivering, delivering services, think about if you own a, if you own Vail Resorts and you ski and you want to open up Vail to get one skier up, you got to open up the whole mountain, right? to get a skier to ski. Similarly, to open up our practice, we have to open up. And we're either open or close and doing something in between is a financial catastrophe when you have no, when you have no patients to come in. Rush Hospital is losing, was losing a million, $1.5 million a day without elective surgery. And I'm telling you, the bailout doesn't cover hospitals. They give them $23,000 to manage a COVID patient when they're losing $1.5 million a day. You can see how this is a catastrophe. The problem is no one was real, really in the initial phases willing to discuss the economics when people were dying in some places in the hallways. And now this is the first time we're discussing the economics and the balance of a medical problem because we kind of have it in control. I'll tell you, just much like Rich, if, if we open the gates and the hospitals get overwhelmed, we're going to be having this conversation again. We're not going to be discussing economics again, most likely, maybe a little. But now we've been afforded the absolute luxury to have this conversation about the balance of economics versus healthcare. It's the same discussion that we had philosophically, you know, at one point, the speed limit. Remember when you were younger, the speed limit was 75 or 80, right? They said, let's reduce it to 60 because we'll save 20,000 lives or 40,000 lives. But that was weighed against truckers saying, I can't ship something across the country. It'll cost me 40% more. So you don't have that conversation until you have the luxury to actually have that discussion and you seek balance. Right now we're in the phase of balance. So we have actually brought, we furloughed about 75% of our individuals. We are now back up to near 100%, part, partly because we have a PPP loan. So we took people off unemployment who were very, who were, who were fr frankly compensated very well on unemployment. Um, I talked to one of my patients yesterday, he, he's getting over $1,000 a week on unemployment. He gets a bonus 600 plus about $453. So he's like, I'm doing pretty well. In fact, I'm doing better, more, I'm doing more better on unemployment uh, than I am uh, when I was working. And uh, that's the unfortunate problem. So the PPP situation, the small business loan, did nothing more than pull people off unemployment, put them on payroll, kept them working. Some of them might actually be making less working than they were on employment. So it's a challenge, but we're back up and running. And where are we now is, uh, we're, you know, we, we have shifted uh, to telemedicine where it makes sense. Telemedicine is not perfect. It is not for every situation. It can be highly inefficient. Uh, and you can miss things. That being said, I think there's a bucket that is perfect for telemedicine, and we're doing that now. Uh, and there's another bucket that is not perfect for telemedicine that really needs to be triaged properly. Uh, so we look at the office visit as a coveted spot. What we did is we said, if you function at 100, we're going to push you down to 70% of your pre-COVID level. That's so we can maintain social distancing and keep it safe for our staff and our employees, uh, excuse me, and our patients and their families. So 
if you come to our office, much like any office, you will get your temperature checked, you will fill out a screening survey, you will then go, you will be given a mask, but we hope that you bring a mask, and you will wash your hands or use hand sanitizer, and you'll come up the elevator, and you'll see, uh, you'll check in, there'll be, the, every other seat or every two seats will be blocked. Now understand, if you're wearing a mask, that doesn't mean you can't be within six feet of someone to protect yourself. You, in fact, what we currently understand, can be within six feet, uh, but you shouldn't be within six feet for an extended period of time. But if you're not touching your face, like I just touched my eye, you're not touching, the average American, I think, touches their face, I think, 24 times an hour. Uh, so just to keep it, it's very difficult. So if you're not touching your face and everything is uh, 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 clean between visits and we pay special attention to cleaning surfaces and you're wearing a mask and I'm wearing a mask and we're avoiding the minimal physical contact and you stay out of range of six feet whenever possible despite wearing a mask, if you have to go within six feet then in, and you've got your temperature checked because that's a very sensitive indicator and you're standing within six feet for as shortest period of time as possible, then I can tell you you're probably as safe going to a physician's office as you are going to a grocery store, and I will tell you, I'm, you know, I have three children. I'm 57 years old. I don't have any comorbidities that I know of, and I'm still, honestly, quite scared to get coronavirus. But I'm going to work not because I'm my income loss. I could probably stop working for a bit, and I would draw on my savings. It would be uncomfortable, and I would not be happy about it. But I'm not working because I am panicked about not making a living. I'm working because I'm. It's very difficult not to work for me emotionally. And I feel very safe, and I feel safer in the healthcare setting managing people who have been screened uh, that as I do in, in anywhere else going out in the community. In fact, I would tell you much more safe. I was telling Rich, I'm I, my family is hunkering down in Indiana in a lake community. My wife is a prosecutor, a state's attorney, who uh, the courts are closed, but they're doing Zoom meetings for hearings and so forth, and um, they are. Uh, so and my kids are all off school. They're doing uh, they're doing uh, video school or you know uh, virtual education. And they're almost done, and uh, so I go from my office to my home, and I'm barely doing anything in between, and I feel pretty responsible. I have 750 resident trainees at Rush uh, who are dealing with known COVID COVID positive patients. Okay, I'm not dealing with known COVID positive patients. They've had five residents convert to being COVID positive as of two weeks ago and two of them believe they got it outside of the hospital setting. So my point is that if you do it right, you can keep yourself safe, you can keep your family safe. We're not allowing visitors, we're asking case managers not to come, but if they wanna come, we'll let them come. I don't know why they wanna be there. We can offer the same value and let them charge and let them do their job. If they wanna come, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna squeeze them out because we still have to offer a good service, but we're gonna make sure they're safe. Uh, so that's, that's generally where we are right now. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. And then I'll just tell you about some of the nuances if we have time about treatment delays and extended disabilities. And the big prominent thing is what I'm seeing now is it goes back to 2008. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to see extended disabilities right now because people are starting to – I'm getting a lot of manufactured symptoms, I'll just tell you, because there's no job for these people to go back to, and they get paid more on work comp than they do on employment. Uh, so uh, I'm just telling you that's something we're going to have to all face. I don't know what side you're on on this, on this uh, webinar, but – I'm a little concerned that I'm sitting here with a uh, differential of uh, uh, the spread between objective and subjective. And as of yesterday, when I saw some patients, I'm like, you were doing great in March. What the hell happened? You know, you don't have one reason not to be doing well. I do 100 of these a year, 99 do just fine. Why are you the one right now who is starting to have subjective complaints you didn't have before? And I got no, I can't figure it out. And I can tell you as a physician, that's frustrating because you, you were in this business to make people better. And all of a sudden things happen. I'm like, this is just... I don't have any other explanation. The fact that you're doing better, it's not going to work. Uh, and I'm not pessimistic. I want to get these people back to work, but I don't cut them a lot of slack uh, when it gets to that level. I, they got to have something for me to sink my teeth into. So Doctor, anyway, what kind, uh, that's what, kind what, of injury, what kind of injury would be not telemedicine friendly? Uh, something that you need an x-ray or a physical exam to differentiate and maybe advanced imaging like an MRI. But I can tell you that I, we were in a situation where the x-rays were told we would have them come in, they'd get their x-rays, and then they would go to, um, they'd get their x-ray, and then what they would do is go home, and then we'd look at their x-ray remotely on our PAC system, and we'd call them. Uh, so that's one. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's shameful to say that the physical exam is not as important as you might argue. Uh, I, you know, everyone's like, well, give me something objective. Most of the world that I live in and work comp in occupational medicine is very subjectively based. You could have an MRI with a full pitch rotator cuff tear and have a normal physical exam. It's all, you know, and I can do a rotator cuff exam. I have them, like, let me see you put your arms up. You can watch their face. 
you can watch what they're doing. I can have them do lots of things, rotation and so forth. I don't really have to look for objective deficit and strength because it's more about pain that guides our treatment and decision making. That's pretty subjective. Explain to our uh, attendees when you have to actually like put your hands on a patient's shoulder or knee and, and what effect does that have and not being yeah, able to Yeah, it's a great question. So in fact, my head research assistant, sorry about the barking, one of the byproducts of COVID is I got a dog that I, my kids found a woman who wanted to give up a dog. They were bored one day. Now I have a dog. So Bring her uh, on camera. We'd love to see her. She's a, it's a great dog. It's a border college. She's awesome, but she's she's as, as high as as type A as I am. If there's any other category, take it and bring it up. If there's like A plus, that's our border border collie. Um, at any rate, um, that's a great question. I'm writing an article today uh, when I get off this call with my one of my research people on the use of telemedicine versus offices and what really needs to come in. So if you came to me, Rich, and you said, look, I have a shoulder injury and I'm trying to differentiate, and you, and, my, and you said, Brian, every time I put my arm across my body or I do a lat pull down and I'm hurting on top, I'd want to put my hand on your top of your shoulder here and say, Rich, is this what you're complaining of? And then the, you can't do this in telemedicine. I'd want to give you probably an injection here to cure your problem to make you feel better. So that would be a bad telemedicine. But as far as a diagnostic thing, I could probably make that diagnosis by telemedicine. I would say, Rich, uh, uh, take off your shirt. Uh, don't worry, I can unsee this when I need to. I'll just turn the video off. And uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is point where you're hurting. And I would say, take your arm, put it across your body. And I would say, Rich, you know, you hurt in the front here in the region of your bicep little groove, you know. I want you to push there and move your arm in and out. I can almost have you do your self-physical exam. But I can't give you an injection. I can't get an x-ray. I can't get an MRI. But I would, I'm, my practice is going to look different moving forward. I'm going to do as much as I can where it makes sense for telemedicine and keep the office visit. You know, if you have to leave your office downtown, Rich, if your office is, you know, downtown, drive to my office, check in, expose yourself. Maybe in the future you won't be exposing yourself. Wait an hour to see me. See me for five minutes. Turn around and reverse that process. All of a sudden you're three hours in for a five-minute visit, which, by the way, the five-minute visit was, it was adequate. You didn't need it anymore. You don't want it anymore. You're, you're happy to get the hell out of there. You got everything you needed in that five minutes. You're like, isn't there another way to deliver this? And my answer is yes. I think there's a lot we can. It's an excellent point. And by the way, a typical cross-examination question that Dr. Cole faces is, oh, how long did you spend with the patient? Oh, five minutes. Oh, well, that means that it wasn't an effective yeah. exam. That's nonsense. I mean, you know, yeah. Dr. Cole is not going to spend 20 minutes with you yeah. five minutes suffices. The last thing I'll say, and then we'll jump, we'll jump to your questions, is remember, I mean, everything that Dr. Cole is saying is a great reminder that frequently what you're hiring Dr. Cole for doesn't need an in-person visit. If you're disputing causation, nothing that Dr. Cole is going to see during a, an in-person exam is relevant to causation. Causation it depends on but the history. Is I got to be able to. I, I have to get a history, sure. Rich. That's Absolutely. important. Absolutely. But that we could get by by video, right? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So you can get that by video, and you could also get that for, through prior medical history. So most of the time, you're going to be finding causation. That's why you're hiring Dr. Cole. That is a perfect uh, uh, example of a case where you don't need an in-person exam, um, and and we haven't you know we haven't done that. We, we for years we've been doing records reviews uh, for that purpose, and that also gives you a chance to preview what the doctor is going to say. All right, really quickly before we turn over to uh, trivia and some amazing giveaways, uh, we got three questions that came in. One, uh, my question is, how are providers able to perform? effective exams via telemedicine visits. We just covered that. Second question, I had an employee who was going to physical therapy prior to our work shut down on March 13th. She still has not gone back. What can I do? Tell her she's got to go. Uh, if that physical therapy um, location is not open or practice, send her somewhere else. There are plenty of PT practices that are actively... Yeah. We, can do, we can do so PT with social distancing, very great hygiene. A lot of PT isn't even direct hands-on. They can show them the exercise and they do them. So they can go to PT and be safe. Right. Uh, third question, is there pending legislation in Illinois regarding COVID-19 presumption? If not, do you see it on the horizon? The answer is no. There. I mean, I don't know if there's anything pending, you know, not being uh, in the halls. Well, of medical people. liability. My liability. They, they, they suspended all medical liability pertaining to COVID. So that patient, the IME patient who got COVID who wants to sue me, uh, I guess I could always be sued. But there, there's legislation in place that prevents malpractice uh, for, for something like that. Yeah, um, in right. Absolutely. In terms of comp, the legislature is going back next week, we hear, finally, after, you know, only the governor has been 
uh, effectively ruling on things. So the legislature in Illinois is going back next week. Uh, they've got bigger issues right now, like the budget is the main issue. There was, as you probably know, a rule change at the commission a couple of weeks ago that caused national uproar because of the great expansion it gave to the number of employees covered as essential employees, and also it gave these people the rebuttable presumption that COVID was related to work. Because of the work um, from a lot of us on the, on the defense side, that rule was overturned. And now there is nothing in Illinois that makes it a rebuttable presumption that it was related to work. They might take it up in the future. Who knows? They, they haven't told us that. Um, the governor said he might take it up, but for now, there are no rule changes or legislation uh, that changes anything in, in Illinois workers' comp. If you have any additional questions that we didn't reach, there are a couple that came in that we didn't have a chance to uh, get to, but uh, you can call me, email me. Dr. Cole's information is available as well. Uh, he is actively seeing patients now and seeing uh, people for IME, uh, IMEs. And Dr. Cole, you've got the last word. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, yeah, just stay safe. Close? Thank you. No, uh, nothing. I'd listen, I know. Uh, we we all come from different walks of life, and as as uh, Mayor Lightfoot uh, said, you know we're uh, this is a non-discriminating situation, and um, I know a lot of you are probably anxious and uh, have uh, a, a several challenges for you and your family and so forth. And I'll you know look, I as I said, we're in medicine because we like to help people, and it, I gave you my email. It's on the chat box. It's b c o l e at rushortho dot com, and I'm happy to be a resource. It's really easy to disseminate information and educate. Uh, and I can do it quickly and efficiently, so don't worry about burdening me. So if you have some questions, anything, feel free to email me. Uh, and hopefully we'll, this will be uh, behind us, uh, and, and then we'll, have, uh, we'll be no worse for the wear. But we're going to be in this for a bit, so let's just continue to work together and uh, help each other where we can. So I wish you all the best and stay safe. And, Rich, thank you for putting this on. You're awesome. Thanks, thank you. Dr. Cole. Appreciate it. See you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone.